Let's just go into what I wanted to preach today. I don't know how much I'm going to get through today, just because I'm continuing on the topic of eternal security. And I kind of just wanted to touch on the objections that people have to eternal security, like the passages that they turn to. But what I found is it's really closely tied in with, you know, work salvation. Obviously, eternal security and being saved only by grace is really closely related to, you know, am I saved by, you know, grace alone? Or am I saved by something I do? Or do I have to keep my salvation? And, and that's why when it comes to passages that people turn to to try and prove that you can lose your salvation, really the explanation for eternal security is similar to, to the explanation that would be for um, salvation by grace. So I thought I'd just um, go to some of the common passages. I've got quite a few to go through. So I don't know how in-depth I'll go into it, but let's just visit them and... Um, I'll see how the time is going and whether I'll stop or not. So let's first go to uh, 1 Corinthians 2. I've just got to get used to navigating this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2. And just start off with a, a principle. Let's see if I can go to verse 12. No, that doesn't work. Let's stay there then. 1 Corinthians 2, let's go down to 12. Because let's start with the principle, because we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, stories today, uh, preaching that Jesus did in the, in the Gospels. We're going to be looking at parables. So it's also always good to start with the principle um, that I believe the Bible teaches, is that you know, we, we interpret, obviously, stories in the Bible with statements. But I like to sort of preface that with, well, you, you have stories in the Bible, you have statements in the Bible, and you interpret, obviously, biblical truths of statements with the stories, and we see, okay, is this, you know, when we read about somebody with multiple wives, for example, was that right or wrong? So we take those statements and we interpret the stories, but we can't negate the fact that there's the New Testament and the Old Testament. So we have to do it in light of the New Testament and the things that have changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we see this principle here in 1 Corinthians 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now the Bible is a spiritual book. It says here in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So there is wisdom from God that ultimately comes from God's Word that has to be understood spiritually. And when the Bible talks about comparing spiritual things with spiritual, we're not comparing man's word with things that are spiritual. We need to compare the spiritual things with spiritual to get a good understanding and then judge what comes from man, judge what comes from the world with the words from the Bible. Um, let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 3. Okay, here we go. just want to show you this here that as we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there was knowledge that was given to the apostles that was not known by those in the Old Testament. And this is why when we read the Bible, you know, we have to understand Old Testament passages. We have to understand passages in light of the New Testament, in light of the New Covenant, in light of the additional wisdom that was given to the apostles um, in order to deliver to us. Look what it says here in, uh, in Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would. So Paul is saying he is here, you've heard of this dispensation, this grace and wisdom that has been given to me in order to minister to you. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which is why it's so important to read the Bible, because that's what we have left from the preaching of the apostles and from the words that they spoke on the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. We have the Bible now, so when we read the Bible, we hear and see and, and understand those words and that wisdom that was given to the apostles. Uh, so whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And look at this which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
So there was knowledge before that was not known that is known now. And you know, one thing maybe like Catholics or Orthodox or Muslims will say, they'll say, oh, you know, we're, we're not really Christians. We're like Paulicians, right? They'll say, you're not really following Jesus. You're just following Paul because that's just Paul's teachings. That, you know, Paul taught salvation by grace, but the real truth was salvation by works. And that's what all the apostles were teaching. You know, Paul is just like this sect that he, and he just started his own religion. Well, my answer to that, or I think the biblical answer to that is, is if you look in Second Peter, uh, let's go to Second Peter 3, and this is going to the end of the epistles that Peter has wrote. And it's, and it's interesting, it's almost like God knew people were going to say that about Paul. Like Paul is just this lone ranger. It's like they say that about Stephen Anderson, right? They say he's just this lone ranger. Like, he's got, like nothing he preaches is from the Bible or anything. It's just, his, it's just this cult mentality. People were probably saying that about Paul. People nowadays say that about Paul. It's almost like you know, the modern New Testament Christian church is like a Paul cult that Paul taught and nobody else um, really taught that or believed that. Well, look at what it says here in 2 Peter 3. Um, and, and this is the second epistle uh, written by Peter. And if you know Peter's position amongst the apostles, he's almost thought as, as like the leader of the apostles, right? You know, like Jesus said that he was praying specifically for Simon Peter, that when he was converted to strengthen his brethren. Um, and we see even in Acts, he sort of takes up this leadership role. So it's interesting that he's the one that makes this comment in his epistle here in 2 Peter 3. Well, we'll read from verse 14. So this is the last chapter of the second epistle written by the Apostle Peter. It says here, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And look at this. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So you see how he talks about here the salvation of Jesus Christ, the salvation of the Lord, and then he, he links himself with Paul. He's saying, it's not just me, Paul's also preaching this. So Peter, which, which is thought of as the leader of the apostles, is here acknowledging that, hey, what I teach is also what Paul is teaching. And he also acknowledges that Paul is given wisdom from God. So remember how Paul was saying in Ephesians, you know, this wisdom, this revelation that's given to me, to you, word? Peter is acknowledging that, Paul has that revelation. So you see how it's not like the, the Muslim faith where Muhammad receives a revelation and he's just like a, a, you know, a lone ranger. Nobody else has received that knowledge. Yeah, that, you, know, you, you tell a Muslim, well, where's your multiple witnesses? And they're like, yeah, everyone did see Muhammad. And we're like, well, we're not talking about the multiple witnesses of Muhammad. We're talking about you know, the different people, the different people that are preaching what Muhammad preached. You know, Muhammad's the only one preaching it. Whereas here, you have multiple people receiving revelation from God, receiving same revelation, even separate, because the apostles walked with Jesus, and uh, Paul, remember on the road to Damascus, he saw Jesus separately from the apostles, and the apostles didn't believe that you know, he, he had actually been converted. They, they were a bit hesitant. But later on, they start to realize, hey, he did actually meet the Lord Jesus. He is an apostle, and and he says here, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. So Peter even acknowledges that Paul has written many letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. So again, he's saying, Paul has written these epistles and they rest these as they rest other scriptures, implying there that what Paul has written is scripture uh, unto their own destruction. Um, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So I'll go into those verses a bit later if I get to that bit in the sermon. So most, so we have this principle that we have, we, we have statements in the Bible and we're going to interpret the stories. You know, these, these are, these, by the way, these air conditioners actually work. I just don't know how to turn them on. So if anyone um, know, can see where the... Oh, there you go. So if you want to turn, if, if Michael, if you want to go figure that out, you can turn on the air conditioners. Um, we just got to remember to turn them off on the way. Do you want to try and navigate, figure it out? Maybe just turn on because otherwise it will start getting really hot in here. Okay, um, so we have this principle 
where we have the stories in the Bible, we have statements. We've got to interpret these stories with the statements and we have to do it in light of the New Testament, acknowledging that there is additional wisdom given in the New Testament to the apostles that was not made known before. And because we have additional wisdom, we can't just look at an Old Testament passage and say, well, that's what the Bible says. We have to understand it in light of all Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we have to take into account what is taught in the New Testament and then interpret the Old Testament. So most objections to eternal security that I'm familiar with, they really start from a story. There, there are some passages that they try and use that are statements and they try and, um, I guess, in, what I would believe is misinterpret those to support eternal security. But we'll, we'll go through those as we go through the sermon. Um, but, you know, we have, we have clear verses that distinguish between work, works and grace. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, we got Romans 4, 5, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I really love showing Romans 4, 5 to Jehovah's Witnesses because even though it's slightly different in their Bible, it still says the same thing. It says without works, it calls our grace undeserved kindness. And even when you go to other passages in their Bible which use the word grace, it uses undeserved kindness as well. For example, like in Romans eleven six, where it says, and if it be of grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. So it all lines up, even in Titus, where it says not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Um, it uses that same phrase, I believe, undeserved kindness. So you can still say to them, you know, you're not, you're not getting this by works. You're not getting this undeserved kindness by works. You're getting it by grace. So we have these clear verses that tell us, hey, we are saved by grace. We, we, are, we have eternal security, just like we went over the last sermon I preached where we have clear verses saying eternal life, everlasting life. Um, and if we don't start with those statement, statements, uh, many verses in the Bible can be misinterpreted to support a works-based salvation. And you know, one thing we have to keep in mind when we read the gospel message, the, read the gospel stories and the, and the gospel books, and I've said this many times before, but remember when you read the gospel, the, the Old Testament is still in effect because the New Testament did not go into effect until we had the death of the testator we learn in Hebrews. So it wasn't until Jesus died, Christ died and rose again and the temple of the veil was rent in twain, signifying that going into the holiest of all, you know, we could now go in there um, spiritually. Uh, that's when the New Testament started. And this is why Jesus spoke in parables. Um, you know, he spoke in parables uh, which fulfilled the law. Because uh, I'll show you here in Matthew uh, 13, that it was actually prophesied of Jesus to speak in parables, and that's why he did it. Um, I won't go to the Old Testament passage, but in uh, Matthew 13, 34, I'll show you here. Um, so he's just, uh, you know, talked about the, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And look at this in verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. See again here that there is additional knowledge in the New Testament that was not known before because Jesus now is going to speak and he's going to make things known that were kept secret uh, from the foundation of the world. So they're secret up until Jesus has come and actually made them known. So that is a, that's a, a, an Old Testament passage that's being quoted there. And this is why you know, Jesus is speaking in parables, the, the Gospels, um, a lot of, uh, of what is happening in the Gospels is still under the Old Covenant. This is why Jesus is still exhorting people to go to the temple and give a sacrifice. He's uh, keeping the Sabbath um, and things like that. And there are teachings about the Sabbath. So you can see, just like the Seventh-day Adventists, that you know, they have this really high view of the Sabbath day, they are not interpreting the statements in the Bible, uh, interpreting the stories and parables in the Bible with statements in light of the New Testament. 
right? Because they'll just say, ah, oh, because see, Jesus did teach to keep the Sabbath. And he, he does talk about keeping the Sabbath. And remember, you know, plucking the ears of corn and all the questions around Sabbath. So people like, you know, the Protestant churches and the Catholic churches and the Seventh-day Adventist churches, they get these teachings about, well, yeah, you shouldn't work on a, on a Sunday. They've somehow changed it to Sunday. But the Seventh-day Adventists, they're like, no, nah, no, nah, the real Sabbath, that's a Saturday, so we don't work on Saturday. But you can do works of grace and works of mercy, like Jesus said, you know, if your ox falls into a pit on the Sabbath, what man of you is not going to pull him out? So they get that principle like, you know, well, somebody might need to work at a hospital on a, on a Saturday or, you know, you've you got obviously got to do things for your family. And um, so they have, I think they have works of mercy, works of necessity and works of um, something else. I can't remember what they're called. So you'll get into that trap of mis misinterpreting passages if you don't have this principle. And the last principle I just want to share with you as well is uh, as we dive into some of these parables, and I might only get through a few of them, but um, is, this, is this truth in the New Testament that is taught that when we believe on Jesus Christ, we have righteousness imputed to us and we actually become righteous in God's eyes. So all of us, it's like we all almost all sort of start at this starting point. When we believe on Jesus Christ, we have that foundation, which is Christ, and that is the righteousness that we receive. So when God looks at us, looks at us he sees a righteous person. He sees somebody that has kept the whole law. But then there are the rewards that if you do over and above, which is things we do in the Spirit, we work for God, we earn rewards above and beyond that baseline, that foundation, which is what we can build upon, you know, gold, silver, and precious stones, as opposed to wood, hay, and stubble. And this is why, you know, when Jesus is preaching about, you know, the parables, and, you know, you've read them yourself before, where it's like, it, it's almost like, wow, this is really teaching a work salvation. What's well, because it is? But if you had to actually get there by your own righteousness, you wouldn't make it. You'd be, the, you'd be the servant cast out. You'd be the guy that, you know, the, in the parable, the person that lost salvation, the, you know, the goat on the left. You'd be the bad tree, for example. But because we have this truth in the New Testament, hey, I, I, it's not my own righteousness. It's the righteousness that is imputed to me. Then now I can understand how this parable truth is a spiritual truth and where I get that righteousness. So I'll show you here in... Uh, Romans 4, we'll just go back there again. I don't know if you've ever noticed this because Romans 4, 5 is obviously a very um, popular soul winning verse because it's very clear to say it's not of works, it's uh, of grace. But I want to show you here, it's, it's not only teaching that um, you, you um, have your sins forgiven when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also have righteousness imputed to you. So verse four says, um, or verse five says, "But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, look at this, his faith is counted for righteousness." So sometimes we read over that and we just think, "Oh, it means my sins are forgiven." But it's not just that your sins are forgiven; it's that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So you see how the righteousness is imputed to you. It's, a, it's, it's accredited or accounted to you. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So you see how your sins are covered, your sins are forgiven. He will not impute sin to you. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't impute sin, he imputes righteousness instead. Cometh, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And then it goes into the Abraham story. So the blessedness, the, the blessing of Abraham believing on him was this imputed righteousness, not just the fact that we have, have our sins forgiven. It's, it's both. Um, it's kind of like a, a, like a double-edged sword. If you have your sins forgiven, then by default, I guess you are righteous, right? Um, because you don't have any sins. So it's both. Now let's go into some passages with that understanding and we'll, I'll breeze over them and give you some thoughts and just explain um, how we can understand this passage. A big one people go to is Matthew 7. So we'll start there. And really there's, um, how many things in here? There's four things in here that people really go to um, in Matthew 7. Our first one is the, the narrow way versus the broad way. 
And, I'll, there, and we'll start here from Matthew 7.13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Now just notice that straight is spelt S-T-R-A-I-T, which, which means narrow. So I believe it's just translated this way, so it doesn't say because narrow is the gate and narrow is the way. Sometimes they use synonyms just to, to, to um, increase the vocabulary a bit. So straight is the gate, not as opposed to straight as opposed to crooked, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. So that's when something's um, straight as opposed to crooked. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So somebody might take this passage and they'll say, you know, and, and the argument would be the same for either work salvation and grace, uh, salvation by grace or even eternal security. They'll say, yeah, you might be saved, but if you're not on the narrow way, then you can get on the broad way and that leads to destruction. And you can see how you can lose, lose your salvation. So somebody might say, well, see, you need to stay on the narrow way. I know Paul Washer who is one of the biggest work save salvation heretics out there, just saying, telling people that they need to fully return from their sin or repent from their sin. I know one thing he always says is, oh, you've got to realize it's not just the gate that's narrow, but the way is narrow too. So it's not just walking through this straight gate, which is Jesus, but the, the way is narrow. So it's like you know, the walk that you have to walk on to get to this gate is really hard. And he just fully preaches a full-on work salvation. But somebody might say, yeah, well, you started on the narrow way, you went through the straight gate, but you've got to stay on the narrow way. You don't stay on the narrow way, you might go on the broad way, and that's going to lead to destruction, you can lose your salvation. So you see how parables are, you know, and, and these, these statements that are in the, in the Gospels, we have to understand them, remember, in the light of the New Testament, in light of other scriptures that are very clear. We know that salvation is by grace, so that can't be the right interpretation. So when it talks about the, the narrow way and the straight gate, what, what verse does that make you think of? It makes you think of John 14, 6, right? Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the narrow way is Jesus. And that's the only way you can get, that's, that is the gate. The straight gate and the narrow gate and the narrow way is Jesus. You know, that's, that's who he is. That's, and you think about it, he even talks about, I am the door. He that entereth in by me shall be saved um, and go in and go out and find pasture. So he is not only the door or a gate, he's also the way that leads unto life and few there be that find it. So when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is taking the narrow way. That is taking the straight gate and you will not be on the broad way that leads to destruction. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Oh man, if I had a penny for every time talking to somebody that believes work salvation to say, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them, you've got to check out the fruit, and they, and they just assume that fruits is works, this is the passage that they're talking about. They're saying that, well, you might be saved, but you can tell the tree by its fruit. You know, you've got sin, you, know, if you're not, you don't have the works, you're going to be hewn down and cast into the fire. So you can see how they can sort of misinterpret this passage or use this passage if they start off with a position of work salvation or losing your salvation, to teach that using this. But we never start from a, a passage like this. We never start from a parable or a story or statements by Jesus Christ that are you know, parables and dark sayings that need to be understood in light of the wisdom given to the apostles. Otherwise, we might come to conclusions like that, uh, wrong conclusions. So what, what, what is he talking about? What, what, what is this fruit? There are different ideas of what this fruit is. Personally, I believe the fruit is the things that they say, right? Um, and I won't go into that into depth now, but I believe this is how you can know false prophets because false prophets are saying false things. You know, they might have the works, right? So they might be clean. Like the Pharisees were really clean, right? But inwardly, they had dead man's bones. So the things that came out of their heart, the things that they say, that's how you judge a person's heart, is by their fruit. 
And, you know, you can go to other passages where you can see fruit is the things that they say. Some people think that it's uh, their, their, um, their works. It could be their works. Um, some people think it's their, their converts. Um, there are different things there, and they all could fit in a way. Um, but I think the, the best one is the fruit of the mouth, what they say, because that's the best way to actually determine who is a false prophet, because they will teach false things. So we have this comparison here, here of the good tree versus the bad tree, and you, people get this frame of mind, oh, you know, you need to make sure you're a good tree to make sure you're saved. Uh, if you're a bad tree, they're going to be hewn down and cast into the fire. But see, anyone that sort of brings you to this passage and says, oh, you know, but you know them by their fruits, the good tree and the bad tree, what they fail to realize is this. It says here in verse 18, it says, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So it's not just about, this passage is not just teaching, it's about just having some good fruit, right? You know, oh, I'm saved because I go to church. I'm, I'm saved because I go soul winning. I'm saved because, you know, I, I don't smoke or don't, don't drink, but I've still got all this other sin in my life. This is not what determines a good tree. It says here, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. So if you're going to try and use this passage and say, my fruit is my works and I'm a good tree, my question is, then who is a good tree? Because the Bible says here, a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. And all of us have sin. If we're going to say that the, the fruit is good works and sin, right? All of us have sin. So then who is a good tree? That means if, if I take this passage to talk about salvation and talk about eternal security, who has salvation? Who is eternally secure by their fruit if the fruit is works. So they are grossly misinterpreting this passage. But if you understand, remember that when we believe on Jesus Christ, righteousness is imputed to us, sin is not imputed to us, we are a good tree by believing on Jesus Christ. And remember, the, the, if the fruit is the fruit of our mouth, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. You know, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, oh, am I saying that the wrong way? In the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So again, this connection between what you believe and what you say and what you believe being counted as righteousness. And this is why I believe, again, another reason why I believe this fruit is your, the fruit that you're saying because what you say uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So that's that good tree, bad tree. Now let's go on. Not everyone that saith unto me, oh, this... You know, that's why Matthew 7, I had to go here, because how many times people go here saying, oh, you know, but people are going to profess, you know, Lord, Lord. Um, but look what Jesus says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy, in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here we have the false professors, right? The people that profess Jesus Christ as Lord. And that's the first thing to note, right? Is that they're not saying, Saviour, Saviour, right? My, my Saviour. They're saying, Lord, Lord. Because they have made him maybe their Lord, but not their Saviour. And that's why people say, you know, people say, Oh, make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Saviour in order to be saved. That's work salvation. Because in order to make Jesus your Lord, you need to do the things that Jesus says, says, otherwise he's not your Lord. So if you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life in order to be saved, that's work salvation. But you need to make Jesus your Savior in order to be saved. That's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and make him the Lord of your life to be saved. Making Jesus the Lord of your life is something that takes a lifetime to do. And you, you never get there. You're striving for perfection. You're striving to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Um, but by his grace, um, we are what we are. So it says here, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now again, people say, see, you've got to do works here. Otherwise, you're not going to go to heaven. But we've got to remember, we, we have the righteousness. We do the will of the Father by believing on Jesus Christ because we have the righteousness imputed to us. Not only is that, but the, one of the wills of the Father, one, of the, one will of the Father is that we believe on him who he sent, right? So we aren't doing the will of the Father because the will of the Father is for us to believe on Jesus Christ and we have believed on Jesus Christ. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? 
Now, this response from these false professors shows that they do not believe on Jesus Christ. See, out of the abundance of the mouth, uh, of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when they are confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, you know, that, that not everyone that saith to him, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, they're not saying, but Jesus, I believed on you. I had faith on you. I, I thought salvation was by grace. I thought I didn't have to do works. Look at the things they say. They say, have we not prophesied in thy name? Aren't we teaching things in your name and spreading your name? You know, go on, soul, you know, tell, telling people about Je Jesus and telling people about your name. And in thy name have cast out devils. So, you know, not all the devil casting out is phony. You know, some of it's real. You know, so I, I believe like they, I, I think they actually did cast out devils. Either they did cast out devils or they just thought they cast out devils. But... I think, you know, there, there is a lot that the de devil can do. There are a lot that devils can do and they can fake. I mean, they like to deceive people as well. They can deceive uh, uh, an ex... An, uh, an, uh, ex what's that word I'm looking for? Exorcism. exorcism, right? They can fake an exorcism and, um, and make you think and make you follow somebody just because they're doing some sort of miracle. And look at this. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the Bible uses the word works there because we know salvation is not of works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So because they're not saved, they're workers of iniquity. You know, their sin is imputed to them. But look, Jesus also says, I never knew you. So in light of eternal security, it's not that these people were saved and lost their salvation. Otherwise, Jesus would have known them. He couldn't say, I never knew you if he knew you before and now you've lost your salvation. So these people in Matthew 7, these false professors, are people that have never been saved. They never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's obvious from their response that they are trusting their works, that they are not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save them. Now, the last one in Matthew 7 is really this house. Uh, the, the, the wise man that built his house upon the rock and the, wise, and the foolish man that built his house on the sand. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that rock and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus has en ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So, here we have these two houses, and again, people will use it. And I, I know I'm repeating myself, but people will use this to say, oh, you know, the, the house, the wise man building his house on the rock. It's not just the people that hear these sayings, but they're the ones that hear them and do them. So they'll say, well, what do you say to that? Isn't that work salvation? So again, we have to understand these passages in light of the New Testament. We know the New Testament teaches salvation by grace. And this is why it's important to know that when we believe on Jesus Christ, we have this imputed righteousness. So when we believe on Jesus Christ, we are building the house on the rock and we are doing them. We are, we, we are doing these works. But it's just in the flesh if we don't do them. If we don't do them in this life, we're not going to get those rewards in heaven, those additional rewards. Now let's go from Matthew 7 to Matthew 25. Just understand a couple of these Matthew 25 is another big one where people go to these parables and try and twist them to contradict what is taught uh, in the New Testament. So the first one we've got here is the parable of the ten virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. 
and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So the story here is you've got ten virgins, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish, and the five were wise because when they went to wait for the bridegroom, they took oil in their lamps. So when the bridegroom came, they trimmed their lamps and they were ready to go in. But when the others went to go buy oil, um, they missed that, that door opening, and when they came back, they cried out, Lord, Lord, and were not able to get in. So people will say, see, the, 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 the five virgins, they weren't ready. They weren't doing the works and ready for Jesus to return. You know, we got, like, especially Calvinists, they'll say, you see, you've got to be ready all the way up. You've got to endure unto the end and keep doing those works. Otherwise, you're going to be those five foolish virgins. So in light of the New Testament, in light of salvation by grace, not of works, you know, what can we glean from this? Well, we know that being ready to meet the bridegroom is salvation. If we're saved, we're not going to lose our salvation because we have eternal security. So we're not going to be these foolish virgins. These foolish virgins are those that are not saved. And a lot of people believe, you know, because oil in the Bible, like the anointing of oil, symbolize the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So the oil representing, they have oil in their vessel. They have, they have the Holy Ghost in this vessel. Because when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We have oil in our vessel, so we are ready spiritually when Jesus Christ returns. We will not be uh, denied entrance into the marriage. Um, and here again, it says here, you know, and the foolish said unto wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And this shows that salvation is a personal decision, right? We can't take our kids to heaven just because we're saved if they're not saved. We can't take our parents to heaven. We can't take our brothers and sisters to heaven. We can't take anybody else to heaven with us based on our salvation. They need to personally believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get oil in their vessel. Otherwise, they will not be allowed to enter into the marriage too. So you see here that they could not give the oil to somebody else. They had to go out and get their own. But if they weren't ready... If they didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if it's too late, the only other way is to do it by works, which is not possible, right? And this is why it says here, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So we're not told, obviously, where the oil came from with the five wise virgins, but it's here that when the situation starts, they already have it. But for somebody to get to where they were, if it's too late, then it's by works, and by works, you're not going to make it as well. That's why even when they went out, to go buy it. They went and did the works. They went back. They still weren't allowed in. Again, and here, this is interesting because when we compare this to Matthew 7, and we read here in verse 11, afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So again, that same phrase, this Lord, Lord, you know, have we not prophesied in thy name and, and in thy name done, uh, cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? So we can see that this situation is the same. You know, it's a parable of ten virgins, but really these ten virgins are sort of likened by this phrase, Lord, Lord, with the false professors that were in Matthew 7, that were trusting their works. So we can see here that there is a link between the virgins trusting their works because the false professors were also trusting their works. So we can understand this passage in that light. Um, and again, he says here, but he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now, isn't that the same? Isn't that the, uh, similar to when Jesus said, Depart from me, I never knew you. Right? He's saying here, I know you not. So again, it's similar there. So that's uh, the ten virgins. Let's go on to um, the parable of the talents. And um, likewise, the parable of the five pounds, uh, ten pounds. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that hath received five talents came and brought, unto, brought other five talents, saying, 
Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye, unprofitable, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, yeah, so that ends there. So we've got a similar parable in Luke. I won't turn there, but it's a parable of the ten pounds. If you don't know the difference, uh, parable of the talents, there's three servants. One's given five, one's given two, one's given one, according to their several ability. So we can understand that to say, well, you know, we're all different, given different abilities. We're all given different, different amounts of intellect. We're also given different amounts of knowledge, you know, or resources. So um, you can apply this parable in different ways. What God has given you, what are you going to do with it, is how he's going to reward you. The parable of the ten pounds is... Each of the servant is given a pound each. So we see here that God rewards productivity because the one servant that took one pound and made it into, I think it's five, I can't remember. I think it's ten, five, and one maybe. So he made it into ten. He's given authority over ten cities. And then the one, one that made it five was given authority over five cities. And then you have the same example, the one that did nothing with it. Um, so things that we are given the same, like we're all given 24 hours in a day, um, things like that. How are you going to use your time? So the parable of the ta talents and the parable of the pounds is another popular one that people go to to say that you can lose your salvation or you have to work your way to heaven because they'll say, you know, you're given these talents and if you don't do anything with them, you don't do anything for the Lord, then you, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. So how do we understand this in light of the New Testament? Now, I for a long time believed that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what the first two have done, right? They've taken their five talents. He's taken his five talents. He's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, made five talents more. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, he's entering into the kingdom. And likewise with the two. But if you take that view that the, the talents that they reproduce equally is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're stuck because... Um, the guy that had won, you know, it's, you'd say, okay, well, he didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he didn't reproduce the one. Um, but then he was, he was cast into hell, right? He didn't do Because if, um, if somebody did nothing with their talent, then, oh, maybe I'm confusing myself. I'm just trying to think like how I, <laughs> how I understood that now. But the, the way I understand that, I wasn't sure where I was going with that thought. I sort of hit a roadblock there. But the way I understand it is, is, oh, oh this is why. Because if, if, if somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and they just have five talents, then, then where's the rewards? Do you know what I mean? Like this, this is meant to be a parable of, hey, somebody has been given this amount and then they reproduce it to five. You know, you know why, why, where, where's the reward for somebody that you know, just believes if, if we're all the same? Because if we believe and it's the same, and it's well done, thou good and faithful servant, well, then what's the point of, of striving to work for the Lord to get, to get more of a reward? Does that make sense? So it shows here that these people were given five, they reproduced it to five, and they were rewarded equally two and two. But if, let's say if somebody had one, and they, uh, and they um, worked for it to give it one, then, that, that, then we would all be equal. There, there would no, be no rewards. So... I guess the question comes down to, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm losing my place here. This is, this is why I don't do ad-lib very well. But I'm losing my place a bit. But 
the person that um, the, the servant people ask, well, why, if the servant did nothing, why was he cast into hell? Now, the way I understand it is is with the usury, right? So, if the person had, if that last servant had put his one talent in the bank to the exchanges and got the usury, did no work at all, he would not. I, I don't believe he would have been cast into outer darkness. He would have got what was free, like salvation, and he would have gone to heaven. Uh, he would have gone to heaven. But if he had reproduced it to one talent, right? Because obviously, when you put money in a bank. It's not 100% usury. You know, you don't put, you know, nowadays, in fact, I just checked my Telenet bank account saver, and it's literally like 1.5%. I don't know how much interest you guys are getting on your savings accounts, but inflation is like 3%. So if you put it in the bank every year, you're like losing 1.5% of your money. So, you know, I've got to get it out of there <laughs> somehow. But um, my point is, when you put money to the exchanges, you're not getting one talent back. You're going to get the usury back. So if he had put it into the exchanges, he wouldn't have been a wicked and slothful servant. He would have went to heaven. But he still would have been lazy. You know, maybe when, when, he, when, the, when the, the master came back, he would have hung his head in shame because he didn't do what the other servants had done. So if the other servants that were given five and two also put it in the bank just to receive the usury, they would have been saved as well. But if you go above and beyond and you earn those rewards, you are going to be rewarded. And that's what we see in the parable of the pounds. Here, what God is showing us is if you are given more, if you reproduce the same amount, you're going to get re rewarded the same as somebody that has less than you. So somebody that might be disabled, somebody that might be intellectually uh, not as sharp as you are, or somebody that may have less resources than, than you have, if they do more for God than you do, they're going to get rewarded more than you. So because we are quite a prosperous people, you know, we have resources, we have time on our sleeves, we have efficiencies, do you know what I mean? We have dishwashers, we have washing machines, we have water on tap. So somebody, say, in Botswana or somebody in the Philippines that has to go down to the local well and take water out and use that time to do their necessities, if they do less for God, they're going to be rewarded more than you because you have all these efficiencies, you have all these different gadgets to make your life so efficient. You have time to go on that holiday, right? You have time to do all those hobbies. You have time to watch football game after football game after football game and do all those things. Hey, well, God's going to expect more from you because you've been given more resources. You've been given more time. That's what we're learning from these, these parables. So these parables are not teaching a work salvation. They're just teaching how God is going to reward us. Because if that last servant had put his money in the bank, he would not have been cast into outer darkness. I believe he was cast into outer darkness because it shows he wasn't even saved. He didn't even get the free gift, the usury, on the investment that God has made in his life. Um, and this is why he was cast into outer darkness. Now, I'll finish up here, but just I'll go just on the last one. I won't spend too much time on it. But let's just read the last parable in Matthew 25 and just understand it in light of the New Testament, in light of eternal security, in light of salvation by grace. And this is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, it says here, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a sheep, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, and uh, naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now I really like that passage, because it shows, you know, sometimes we think, man, I want to serve Jesus, right? And, I, and sometimes we think, 
Well, serving Jesus is, you know, going out and winning the souls. But I actually see the soul winning, you know, the work of evangelism is working with Jesus. You know, you, you, you take the yoke of Jesus upon you, right? You take up the cross daily and follow him. Or, you know, you're working in the vineyard with Jesus, striving to bring forth fruit. But when the Bible talks about serving Jesus, that's different because you're actually, when you serve somebody, it's when you're doing, you, you're ministering to them, right? You're serving Jesus as opposed to obeying Jesus, you know, working for Jesus. So when I think about serving Jesus, you sort of think, well, how do I serve Jesus? Because Jesus is not here. You know, Jesus is, is in heaven. He's, he's in heaven waiting to come back. How do I serve? Is it a spiritual serving of Jesus? But no, but because we get some practical application from the Bible when we think about the body of Christ being the church. We see here that Jesus says, if you do this to the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So we need to keep this in mind that if you love Jesus and you want to serve Jesus, you need to serve the body of Jesus. So when you help somebody with something, you help them move, you help them with something else, or you, you, know, you, you give them encouragement, you, you help them to grow in their faith, this is how you practically serve Jesus. You know, this is what Jesus wants to see. This is why by this shall men know that you are my disciples because of your love one for another. Because if you love Jesus, you're going to love his body. You're going to serve the body. You're going to love to see his body. You know, this is why, you know, it doesn't make sense to me if people love Jesus, but they don't want to be at church. They, they would rather hang out. They love Jesus so much that they would rather hang out with unbelievers than hang out with the body of Christ and hang out with believers. So we need to grow in that love. We need to grow in that love for one another. And, you know, the people in this room ought to be your closest friends. And if they're not, then you need to start working on those relationships. Start serving one another and then you'll, you know, have friends. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So it's a great principle here to see, hey, you know, even if that thing wasn't seen by the masses, if you just give a cup of cold water, if you just do one of these things, the least to the least of these, my brethren. So this is somebody that's not known. It's not how much you do for me or somebody that is in a position of you know, public view and everyone knows that you've done it. Even if you do the things for the people that are, uh, you know, are less visible in the church, Jesus sees that and he's going to reward you for that. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also say unto him, they answer unto him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hungered, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, and in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, verily, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these, so the, the, the goats on the left that didn't do these things, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So I probably don't need to, to, to say it again, but you can probably see now as I'm going through these parables with the principles of the statements in the Bible and the New Testament, you can start to see, ah, this is how I understand these parables. And I don't think it's a coincidence actually that Jesus did it this way in the sense that he spoke in parables. Remember he says that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand. I have a feeling Jesus has these passages in it because sometimes those of us that believe the truth and believe salvation by grace we're just like sometimes i read them and i'm just like why is this passage in here it just makes my life so hard you know like because people just have these passages to go to and just believe work salvation and then i to explain to them these principles and explain like no you have to understand this and then you know this is why all these cults appear and all jehovah's witnesses go into all these and you know, even Muslims will go to these, right? And say, ah, oh, Jesus taught that you've got to be righteous as the Pharisees and, and all these things. But it's because they're not saved, right? They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand in light of the other scriptures how to understand this. And sometimes I think maybe this is the delusion that God sends them. You know, like God sends them strong delusion that they might believe a lie, that they all might be damned and to believe not the truth because they're not willing to believe salvation by grace that they will go to these passages and just say, ah, ah, Here's a passage that teaches salvation by works. You know, and that's, they're just deluded with, I guess, God's word in a sense because they're not understanding it spiritually. They don't believe 
all of God's word. They're just taking these passages and then pushing uh, their doctrine of work salvation. So you can see here, well, what's the answer, right? Between the sheep and the goats. Remember the imputed righteousness. So because we believe on Jesus Christ, we have done those things. You know, and this is why if you believe on Jesus Christ, you'll be in the sheep um, side. And, and if you haven't believed on Jesus Christ, you're going to be a goat. And therefore, if you're a goat, you go away into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are counted as righteous. Remember, his faith is counted for righteousness. It says here, but the righteous unto life eternal. And that lines up with what we learn in the New Testament. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, I'll end it there, because if I go on to another parable, it's probably going to take a long time. And uh, I'll continue this, just going through these different passages. Um, we'll go to a few um, other examples next week of like sort of statements that people will use and how to correctly interpret those. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you that, um, uh, Lord, uh, it's just simple faith to believe on you, uh, receive the Holy Ghost. And then, Lord, we can spiritually discern this book and, and understand these passages. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for you know, the men that have gone before us that have helped us to understand these truths. I thank you, Lord, for the men that have um, risked their lives in order to give us the Bible that we have today. Now that it's in electronic form, I pray, Lord, that it'll, it'll never um, uh, leave us. But I pray, Lord, that um, you'll help us to study it because having it is, is not useful to us at all, Lord, if we don't study it and meditate on it and, and, and preach it, Lord, that we are a doer of the work so we're not a forgetful hearer. Help us, Lord, all, help us all here, Lord, to be doers of the work. Help us to love one another as you loved us and uh, help us to serve one another so that, uh, Lord, uh, when we uh, meet you on Judgment Day, um, we'll, we'll uh, hear those blessed words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank you, Lord, and um, pray that uh, um, you bless uh, our fellowship together now, and we love you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.